Our first speaker today is Adam Kaya. He's a postdoc at Potsdam University and is working in the area of numerical analysis and scientific computing. And today he will talk about conditioning analysis for discrete Helmholtz problems. Adam, please go ahead. Please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, before I start, I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about conditioning analysis for discrete Helmholtz problems. And uh, I'm going to show something new using calculus techniques uh, so that everybody can easily follow my presentations. Uh, so this is the outline of my talk. Uh, first, briefly, I will explain why it is difficult to solve uh, the Helmholtz problem, especially for large wave numbers. Then I will introduce a novel method to observe near zero eigenvalues of an indefinite matrix that satisfies certain conditions. And using this technique, uh, we will analyze different uh, discretization uh, schemes. Then we will see what happens in two space dimension and uh, finally commuting remarks. Uh, here we see the Helmholtz problem in one space dimension with uh, directly boundary conditions. Uh, here C is the wave number and the exact solution of this problem is given here. As we can see from this term, this uh, uh, problem may be very ill conditioned. Uh, and in literature, C times H is used as a magnitude to measure success of a met uh, method. Here H is the mesh size. And here uh, there are two situations. Uh, I can either fix C and change H or fixed H or change C. If C is fixed, that is the wave number X fixed, uh, there is no problem in the analysis. Uh, but if H is, H is fixed and C is varying, then I have to, to be careful because the continuous problem may be very ill conditioned. And to make uh, it well conditioned, I choose the wave number as J plus one half times pi, where J is a positive integer including zero. And so that the uh, exact solution becomes either minus sine of Cx or uh, sine of Cx. And the scale of the exact solution uh, is always between minus one and one uh, in this case. Uh, so in literature, uh, there are two known difficulties for large wave numbers in solving the Helmholtz problem. Uh, standard discretization schemes such as finite difference or finite element uh, methods suffer from pollution effect. Uh, this is simply the phase difference between exact solution and numerical solution. And the second problem uh, is that the standard iterative schemes such as multigrid or domain decomposition methods suffer from slow convergence. They may even fail. And uh, we can also add uh, another problem. This is not mentioned in literature, blow up or damp solutions. This blow up is very clear uh, when directly boundary condition is used. And I want to show one example here. On the left figure, we see the numerical solution and the exact solution. And uh, we can clearly see the difference between scale of the numerical solution and exact solution. So there's a blow up here. And on the right figure, there is no blow up, although C times H is greater on the right. Uh, so as I said, direct boundary condition is not used in applications. However, we encounter uh, uh, such kind of problem uh, for residual free bubbles method. So it's a finite element method. It uses uh, sub problems that assumes uh, homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition. And recently I applied this method uh, to the Helmholtz uh, equation and obtained very good results. Up to CH equals 3.5, it is robust and uh, pollution free. Uh, and in literature, to do best of my knowledge, there is no conditioning analysis. And the main reasons are discretizations of the Helmholtz problem lead to indefinite matrices for large wave numbers. And in this case, it is uh, difficult to observe the near zero eigenvalues. And the second problem, standard definition of yield conditioning based on the condition number of matrices is not true in this case. Uh, in this article, the authors say that Thus, in solving the Helmholtz equation numerically, small condition number does not imply the problem is well conditioned. Okay, so this is the uh, main discretization scheme uh, for our model problem that depends on the parameter alpha. When alpha is zero, 
uh, this finite difference scheme is equivalent to the standard second order finite difference scheme. When alpha is 0 0.5, it is a fourth order finite difference scheme proposed in this article. When alpha is one, it is equivalent to the standard linear Galerkin finite element method in one space dimension. When alpha is two, it's a finite difference scheme for which the system matrix never becomes diagonally dominant. And this will be important in determining different regions. Okay, so in some way, I have I want to relate the yield conditioning with the condition number. And here we see a scalar oscillatory function. And it is well known that this function is yield conditioned. And here there is another indicator of yield conditioning for this function, which is uh, f prime uh, of x, that is the derivative of f. Uh, that is the derivative of f uh, is also yield conditioned here, and it's an yield indicator of yield conditioning of f. And using this, we say that if the function of the condition number is oscillatory or ill conditioned in a region, then the corresponding function or uh, for our case system matrix is ill conditioned in that region. Uh, so uh, here uh, on this picture, uh, I want to explain uh, my method here. Uh, here I assume that the matrix under consideration is indefinite, however, this technique works for positive definite and uh, negative definite matrices to, uh, to observe the near zero eigenvalue as long as the conditions hold. Here, uh, lambda k is the eigenvalue curve. Uh, I assume that it is continuous in k. i and i plus one are two successive integers. Lambda i and the lambda i plus one are the two near zero eigenvalues. k star is the root of lambda k and tk is the tangent line passing through k star. And now let, let us focus on lk. Uh, and uh, let us assume that the root of lk is fixed. If the tangent of lk increases, then we can say that lambda i and the lambda i plus one move away from zero. So how can we predict the tangent of lk? So we look at the tangent of lambda k, because it's a good approximation to the tangent of lk. Uh, and uh, by the way, here I assume that lambda k is locally increasing or decreasing. Uh, so we say that if the tangent of L lambda k is increasing, then lambda i and the lambda i plus one move away from zero, as long as the root of lambda k, that is k star, uh, the location of k star does not change much. Now, based on this observation, uh, we analyze our schemes. We start with the case alpha equals zero. Uh, so we have a symmetric three diagonal matrix uh, and so that we can explicitly find the eigenvalues. And it is clear that lambda k is an increasing function in k. And the root of lambda k is arc cosine of something over pi over h. Uh, here, lambda of k has no root in this interval between zero and n minus one when ch is greater than or equal to two because as is diagonally dominant. And uh, so we work in this region uh, where ch is between uh, zero and two. And in this region, we are very lucky that the term inside the R cosine is between minus one and one. This guarantees that R cosine has a convergent Tyler series expansion at ch equals zero. And here we see this expansion. Now I take this, take the first term and substitute it into the k star, and uh, I end up with j plus one half. So this says that as long as c times h is a good approximation to arc cosine, k star behaves like j plus one half. Here uh, I assume that h is fixed. Uh, if c is fixed, then k star behaves like c over pi. Uh, so to find this region, I plot the graphs of these two functions. And here uh, we, I can say that up to ch 0 0.6, ch is a good approximation to r cosine. So in this region, uh, k star is stable in terms of ch. Here, here I want to emphasize that this upper bound 0 0.6 is not sharp. Now the second uh, point uh, I want uh, to find the regions where lamb, uh, the tangent of lambda k at root is increasing or decreasing. And to find this, I take the derivative of lambda k and then substitute k star into it. And I end up with this expression. And using second derivative test, 
I find these two regions. In the first region, where CH is between zero and square root two, uh, the tangent of lambda k at root, at root is increasing. And in this region, where CH is between square root two and two, it is uh, decreasing. Now, combining all information, uh, we get three different regions. Uh, in the first region, where CH is between zero and 0 0.6, K star is stable in terms of CH. And the tangent at the root is increasing, and hence we expect the near zero eigenvalues to move away from zero. And so we can expect the condition number to become smaller for larger CH. In the second region where uh, CH is between 0 0.6 and 2, K star is not stable. Moreover, in most of this region, uh, the tangent of lambda K is uh, decreasing, and hence we can ex we expect abrupt changes. Uh, for the condition number. When CH is greater than or equal to two, AS is diagonal dominant and has the condition number uh, is close to one. And here uh, we see the condition number for different values of CH. Here uh, for this test, H is fixed and C is varying. And we can see that up to CH uh, equals 0 0.6, condition number is monotonically decreasing. And in the second region, we see abrupt changes here. In the third region, it uh, turns to one. So in the first region, I say AS, the, the matrix is relatively well conditioned. Here, I prefer to say relatively well conditioned because as I said here, uh, H is fixed and C is uh, varying. If I decrease H for the same values of uh, wave number C, then the condition number becomes larger in the first region. And because of this, I prefer to say uh, relatively well conditioned. And in this region, numerical solution is a good approximation to the exact solution. In the second region, AS is ill conditioned and uh, we see pollution effect uh, and we may see blow up also. Uh, and in the third region, AS is well conditioned. Uh, the condition number is close to one, however, the, here there is another problem. The discrete Helmholtz equation behaves like discrete reaction dominated reaction diffusion uh, equation in this region. Now let's see what happens uh, when alpha is equal to 0 0.5. Uh, in this case, we have a fourth order finite difference scheme. Again, we have a symmetric three diagonal uh, matrix uh, AF. And here uh, the root of uh, lambda k is uh, R cosine of something over pi over h. Uh, in this case, AF is diagonally dominant when CH is greater than or equal to six. So we work when CH is less than square root six. Again, we are very lucky that the term inside the R cosine is between minus one and one. Uh, and hence we have a, a convergent Tyler series expansion for R cosine at CH equals zero. And again, using the first term, we get the same algebraic expression for k star. So we uh, we want to find the region where ch is a good approximation to r cosine. Uh, to this end, I plot the graphs of these two functions, and I can say that up to 1.2, ch is a good approximation to uh, r cosine. Again, 1.2 is not a sharp bound here. Uh, to find the regions where lambda k, uh, lambda of k is increasing or decreasing at the root, we take the derivative of it and then substitute k star into it and we end up with this expression. Then using second derivative test, uh, we find these two regions. In this region where ch is between zero and square root three, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lambda prime of k star is increasing. And in this region where ch is between square root three and uh, square root six, it is decreasing. And combine all information, we see that the first region is uh, when CH is between zero and 1.2. The second region is 1.2 and uh, square root six. And the third region is when CH is greater than square root six. And here we see uh, the condition numbers uh, for uh, varying CH. And we can clearly see that uh, it is consistent with the regions I uh, found analytically. And here, one, I want to say one point here. In the second region, the condition number may be larger than the condition number in the first region. Here, we see a blow up here. So this is possible. 
So when alpha is one, we the finite difference scheme is equivalent to the uh, finite element uh, discretization, linear finite element discretization in one space dimension. And here I omit the details. Uh, again, we have three different regions. Uh, the first region is between zero and 0 0.6. The second region is between 0 0.6 and square root 12. And the third region is uh, when CH is greater than or equal to square root 12. Again, here we see the condition numbers for different values of CH, and it is consistent with uh, the regions I uh, found analytically. And when alpha is equal to, we have a finite difference scheme for which the system matrix never becomes diagonal dominant for increasing CH. So in, in this case, we have two different regions. The first region is between zero and 0 0.4. The second region is when CH is 0 0.4. Uh, and here we see the condition numbers. Uh, and again, in the first region, it is monotonically decreasing and we see uh, uh, abrupt changes in the second region. Now, uh, uh, now let us see what happens in two space dimension. So to this end, we consider the Helmholtz problem with homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition. And here I use standard second order finite difference scheme. And I can express the matrix in terms of uh, AT and identity matrix A using uh, Kron. Uh, AT is defined here. It's a symmetric three diagonal matrix. And here uh, we see that, and for this uh, uh, test problem, H is, uh, C is fixed, H is varying here. And we see that uh, the monotonicity is not preserved up to 0 0.6 here. Uh, so the first region is smaller in this case. And now I consider another finite difference scheme, which is fourth order. Uh, uh, it was proposed in this article. It uses nine point stencil. And in this case, we see that uh, the first region is between zero and roughly 1.3. Uh, and then we see the second region. And finally, in the third region, uh, the condition number tends to one. So concluding remarks. So we have three different regions. In the first region, the system matrix is relatively well conditioned. Numerical solution is a good approximation to the exact solution. And in the second region, the system matrix is ill conditioned. Maybe we can say very ill conditioned. We may see blow up or damp solutions. And blow up is very clear for the uh, Dirichlet problem. And we see damp solutions when Neumann or radiation boundary condition is used, but if the scale of the exact solution is small, this may not be so easy to notice this. And we also see pollution effect in the second region. Uh, in the third region, uh, not every problem has this region. The system matrix is well conditioned. Uh, and the condition number is close to one. And this is definitely an advantage uh, in obtaining solution of the discrete problem. However, the discrete Helmholtz problem imitates a reaction dominated reaction diffusion problem. Here uh, in this region, I can set up a reaction dominated reaction diffusion problem such that its discretization with a standard scheme gives the same uh, discrete uh, problem. And we see a similar uh, transition between uh, convection diffusion and the Helmholtz uh, uh, equation. Uh, for convection diffusion equation, when convection dominates uh, and uh, when a standard uh, discretization scheme is used, we see an oscillatory solution that looks like a solution of an Helmholtz problem. And finally, I want to say that in the third region, uh, since uh, uh, this solution is irrelevant to the exact solution, it imitates a reaction dominated reaction diffusion problem. There is no need to do analysis for pollution effect in the third region. And thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Adam, for this very interesting talk. Uh, Catherine, do we have questions for Adam in the Zoom and Q&A? Uh, I think, uh, oh yes, so Frank has a question, but part of it didn't go through. Maybe he can type it again. Um, I, I actually have a question, maybe while he's typing it, that's probably a bit silly. I was curious how you managed to get um, analytic representations for the eigenvalues. Was this it was, is this very obvious or does it, does this take a lot of work? Uh, 
So in one space dimension, in all cases, uh, I have a symmetric three diagonal matrix so that I can uh, express the eigenvalues in terms of uh, CH here. I see. Uh, yeah. But using this, I can find, uh, find the regions analytically. I see. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then Frank's question, uh, uh, he says CH should be replaced by C, uh, C, C dot H. I, so this should be the product of two things, but I think that's clear. C squared H or something? I'm not sure. Just it says C H should be replaced by C C dot H. C C. Um, but we can may I, perhaps he can ask you more clearly in in the gather session. Yeah. Okay, uh, then Davide, are there questions in the YouTube chat? No questions on YouTube. Okay, then we can move over to the second speaker. Thanks again, Adam.